several of us from the Wellspring program are going to talk about what it's meant to us during the past year. It's been my privilege to be one of the facilitators for Wellspring this year, and I'm really delighted to have the three speakers who will follow me today um, to have gotten to know them so much better in this program. The Wellspring program is a program developed for the UU Church, which is intended to put the special UU spin on deepening one's spirituality. It runs through the school year, meaning more or less once, um, twice a month, and it includes several parts. One is learning about the history of Unitarian Universalism and how others who are sort of free-thinking types have dealt with these issues, the big issues of life, over the centuries. Uh, there is a chance for spiritual direction or guidance, uh, a chance to develop a spiritual practice of some sort, and given our tradition, that is uh, defined very broadly, and a chance for deep listening. The three speakers who follow will talk about how that program has worked for them this year. In the Wellspring program, we were asked to choose a spiritual practice. And I'm a single parent that doesn't have one of those handy-dandy 50-50 deals, so I don't have much free time for meditation and yoga on a regular basis. So I chose parenting. One of the things about parenting is that I examined how I myself was parented. One of my earliest memories of spirituality is when I was four years old and my father initiated me into transcendental meditation. And that's the one the Beatles had made popular. I remember that moment, and I remember what I learned. I learned that I could think, and that thinking was this process occurring inside my head, and I had some kind of control or influence over it. But as I grew older, if I told my friends about meditation, or worse, if I mentioned that my parents practiced a flying technique, I lost my playground credibility. It was a type of social isolation. And when they were raising me during the 70s, people didn't know what a vegetarian was. So if I told people I didn't eat meat, they looked at me like I had two heads. So I learned another thing. I learned to stop sharing with people. My family test drove many spiritual paths during my growing up years. There was a period of Christianity. Then there was the S training slash forum, the alivening program, the rebirthing, the chakra balancing, the list goes on and on. And then there was the guru in India. And sometimes I try to talk to people about him because I guess I didn't learn my lesson as a kid. So I start off saying how I was disillusioned when my guru turned out to be a pedophile. And then I explain the depth that I was involved with this, how I would go to India, how I received personal attention. And, they, and these were like the wow things, the oh, you're so spiritual things. And they were impressed. And I was like, did you miss the opening sentence? Hanging out with a pedophile is not cool. Hurting young boys is not spiritual. And what I learned from this was that being seen by others as spiritual is not spiritual. It's merely a boost to the ego. Spiritual belief. I always try to watch out if my spiritual beliefs are superior. Atheist beliefs can also be very prone to this because logic seems superior to blind belief. But as soon as you start believing that what you're believing is somehow superior to what others are believing, your ship is really sunk. It's the ego quicksand of spirituality and religion. When I boil down all that I've learned from the spiritual hodgepodge of my past, I have learned to stop placing someone else in the driver's seat of my spiritual life. Whether they're a current living person or a legend from long ago, I believe in being open to receive what life has to teach me without crediting someone else. This is between life and me. And this is what I want to teach my children. Because as a child, I first learned that I could think, and then I spent the next period of my life living in fear and allowing an other 
to tell me what to think and building a spiritual ego. Parenting as a spiritual practice is tricky because it's a lot easier to be spiritual during meditation than it is each morning. When I have three lunches to make, three breakfasts to get on the table, sunblock, bug spray, teeth to brush, two kids that won't even get out of bed but need to be on the other side of town in an hour, and I need to be on the opposite side of town in an hour. I used to spend most of my morning routine yelling, most of the bedroom routine as well. And I know it's ineffective, and I want to change, but I don't know how. This is my goal, and I don't know how to achieve it, but I put it out there to life, not to some magic man. And I trust myself to achieve my goals, even when I don't know how. During our Wellspring meetings, which had no so-called enlightened leaders, we each had a chance to speak, but more important, we had a chance to listen, a clean, pure listening, no fixing, no talk back, just listen. And now I'm beginning to listen to myself as well. The chatter inside my head, just listen. Don't try to fix myself. Don't yell at myself. Practice non-judging, practice not yelling, and practice holding love in the space where love seems absent. So I asked my kids the other day if they thought I was yelling at them less. And they said yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. I signed up for Wellspring looking for guidance as I faced two turning points in my life. My daughter was turning 18, and it was my 60th year. I wanted to spend the year thinking about how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. A simple bucket list would not do. I wanted to look more deeply at what is most important in my life and whether I was living according to that. And I was looking to my spiritual side to guide that process. I had turned to a similar program, uh, a year-long program, once before in my life at Midlife, a program based on spirituality and personal growth. That program helped me grow in ways that made all the difference in the following years. And at the end of that program, I made a major career change, one that I never regretted. So now, facing another life transition, an empty nest, life's autumn years, I turned to Wellspring and it turned out to be just what I needed. The topics we discussed and read about helped me explore my values, life's meaning, and relationships to myself, the people in my life, and the world. <clears throat> Learning the history of Unitarian Universalists was a unique aspect of Wellspring that led to a sense of profound gratitude to our church's ancestors. The questions of spirituality they grappled with are the ones we grapple with today. The most life-changing aspect of Wellspring for me, however, was the group itself. Hearing their interpretations of the material we read and how it related to their lives was where I learned the most. I was inspired by their courage and wisdom and touched by their inner beauty. And now, having completed my Wellspring year, it is often their words that come back to me. And I did end up coming up with at least one thing that I want to do with my life at this point. I want to facilitate the next year of Wellspring. And if anybody's interested in talking about that with me, I'll be at the table after the service. Um, so Lewis is one of the other facilitators, and he had suggested that I give the atheist experience. But just as I don't think about God, I also don't think about atheism, so I'm going to jettison that. 
Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll kind of give the top two points of various um, steps along the way. So I'll start with the two key reasons why I did Wellspring. Um, the first one is that I've been going to UU churches since my first daughter was born, which is about half my life now. But I still tend to think of myself as a former Catholic, not a UU. So I thought that learning more about Unitarian Universalist faith would help me see myself more as a UU. And as a spoiler alert, um, it didn't. <laughs> but it helped me not stress or feel guilty about that, so I could not worry about that. Um, the other reason I did Wellspring is a year ago in the summer service when last year's Wellspring group was speaking, um, the people that talked really inspired me. The stories weren't about the holy aspect of spirituality, which I'm not looking for. They were more about working towards living the life you want to live. I have struggled with the work-life balance for about 30 years now, way too much work and not enough life. And um, now that my children are grown, it's actually gotten worse. I have more time to spend at work. So um, the other thing is when I'm not working, I'm doing all these things for other people, for my family, doing Moral Mondays, volunteering, and I don't um, seem to find time for myself. And I got to the point where I didn't even feel like I had time to come to church for one hour uh, on Sundays to get inspired. So. I thought, my life was out of whack, I'll, I'll do Wellspring for a year. Um, so in terms of what Wellspring involved, what I was looking forward to was a 10-month commitment, uh, meeting two evenings a month with readings and questions to think about in advance of the meetings. And I really liked that I was going to carve out that time just for me. What I was dreading was the one aspect where you have to choose a spiritual advisor and, and you're given a list of suggested ones and you're gonna meet with that person once a month. And um, I was hung up on paying someone for spiritual advice when I'm not really looking for spirituality. And I was also worried about choosing the wrong spiritual advisor. So I guess I have a, uh, a perfectionist streak. What if I picked the wrong one? Um, and then I was also a little bit stressed out about paying for something that I didn't even want when we're still, we were in our last year of paying college tuition, and I didn't even, um, I didn't want to spend money on myself, and I didn't want to tell my husband I was going to be spending this money. But anyhow, and it's not very much money, <laughs> but it was for me. So, in terms of what I got out of Wellspring, I really loved it. It was um, one of the best things that I've ever done. I liked that it was a 10-month sustained program. Um, oh, it, the other thing I was going to say is that my husband and daughters really liked that I did it, and they wished that Wellspring was continuing. So, <laughs> um, But I liked that it was a 10-month sustained program. We explored different topics, um, faith background, prayer, forgiveness, history, Buddhism, joy, death, and each of us came came to the evenings with a different experience, a different take on the readings, different insights, and different takeaway points. Um, each of us was working on our own, something personal for us, and every session contributed a little bit to it in our own um, personal story. It was a cumulative effect. Um, I'm not a person who likes the idea of a spiritual journey. I'm a see a problem and fix it person. Um, but you can't fix a 30 year problem of having work life balance out of whack um, overnight. So it was a really good thing for me to work on it for 10 months and keep working on it. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked was working with my spiritual advisor. <laughs> That was what I was like, so I do not want to do this. Um, and even in the first month, I would talk about, no, I didn't find one yet. Cause, um, and, I, and I like to call her my life coach rather than spiritual advisor. Um, and I'm going to keep meeting with her. <laughs> um, so that was a nice thing. And she would give me insights and ideas for how to face you know, specific work things that I was dealing with, but also um, general approaches that could apply to anything, whether it was work or life. 
Um, and it's been really nice to have somebody to talk to. Um, I wish everyone had a life coach, and I guess I was overdue for one. Um, so now I'll kind of I'll end with two Wellspring-inspired quotations. Um, these I wrote down on yellow sticky notes, and I have them stuck on my computer so that I can apply them at work. Um, the first one is a Buddhist message, and this works well for work interactions, and it also works well for irritating things your spouse or partner might do. Um, it, and it's the person who is causing you suffering is suffering too. Be compassionate to his or her suffering. And the other one that I have on my sticky note is a three-part message. And my bread and others have shared it many times in sermons here. But I'll give it as a, a refresher. Um, and it can also be applied in many situations. It's do what you can want what you have, be who you are. So as Karen said, um, the rest of us will, will be at the table um, during tabling if any of you want to talk to us about the Wellspring experience. 